Welcome to JFK and the Enduring Secret. I'm your host, Jeff Crudell. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mysteries of the Enduring Secret. And this is Episode 3, where we interview William Matson Law, who joins us for a discussion, well, perhaps a reevaluation of the events at Bethesda the night of November 22nd, the events of the autopsy. In our JFK Enduring Secret podcast preview, I thought Rick Russo did a great job laying out what he believes happened at Bethesda. But of course, it's quite different than the official story. And to quote Rick, and it also turns research done by David Lifton and Doug Horn and others a bit on its head as well. And he does that with the introduction of his finding that two different morgues actually existed at Bethesda in 1963 and all that flows from such a revelation. If we were to go into that very short thing I read about in the summer of 1916, talking about the new wing being built, and then after that, we go right into the audio interview clip of of Carney with Cunningham, where he, because this really came from him, he is telling you know the fact that well there were there was an old morgue and then we had the new morgue, and then after that audio clip, then we just present the simple question: Well, what does all this mean? In the scheme of things, yeah. that there were two morgues, could they have been used? Could both of them been used that night or whatever? And then, and then the discussion is off and running. How does the knowledge of the fact that there were in fact two morgues uh, at Bethesda, you know, fit into everything we think or we thought we knew up to this point? Is there a? Can you remember? If you want me to explain this question, I can. Can you remember where the naval barber shop was at the hospital? The naval barber shop at the hospital. I see. I'm trying to remember now. That's that's going back a ways. Uh, <laughs> Last time you got your, your haircut was wasn't 33 years ago. Well, no, well, no, because the thing is, the barber shop at one time was right directly across from the old morgue. Um, and then when the assassination occurred, wasn't that wasn't that the new morgue? Well, it was the uh, well, yeah, it was the new morgue uh, in the in the new wing, building eight at that time. Um, and I think the God, where was the barber shop? I I think it was across from where the old morgue was, and of course um, they brought supplies and so forth into that area after they uh, took away that you know built the new morgue. Uh, and that's where the Navy's change was too. Uh, it was right on that same level, which was the uh, basically, basically the uh, the lower level of the main building. Would that have been above the morgue, or is that a separate building? A uh, separate building. I mean, the new morgue was in Building Eight, which is a wing. If you're facing the building off to the right hand side, um, and the old morgue was basically. In the connecting portion from the tower back to building eight. I presented you tonight with a whole buffet. And in essence, uh, what we're really going to do for this podcast is start the meal off with the dessert. And then, uh, and then we just talk about the ramifications uh, of the fact that now all of a sudden we're finding out from Dr. Carney. Uh, in, in this hidden interview or old interview or whatever, that there are in fact two morgues, which may explain a lot of what we thought we knew. We've asked a famed author, uh, William Law, to discuss this with us in today's podcast episode. You see, in 1960, a new hospital tower was built at Bethesda, which contained a new morgue. The existence of these two morgues the old one and the new one, and the picture that Rick paints about how things were conducted that night. As a result, it really does seem to be the answer to many things previously unexplained. 
things that did not previously make any sense. Different sets of witnesses, all purportedly in attendance at the morgue, but for some reason describing different circumstances or different physical surroundings. Well, now all of these incongruent things now seemingly fit into the puzzle, at least many of them for sure. One thing that listeners and viewers of the podcast preview episode and this related YouTube video should know that the podcast preview episode grew out of a rather long and very informal three-hour conversation that Rick and I were having. That whole conversation, at least as it started out, was not initially meant to be part of a primetime presentation. But Rick's off-the-cuff articulation of things was so astonishing to me. In that one conversation, man, the fact that we had actually recorded it, well, I just had to turn it into the preview episode. What the listeners didn't get in that rather dramatic piece, though, is something that Rick had provided to me earlier and something that the audience hasn't seen or heard yet. Rather methodically, Rick took me through detailed testimony taken under oath by various witnesses at Bethesda. And there is more, including statements made to various researchers and drawings made of the two morgues. Rick provided schematic layouts of the Bethesda campus, all of which help us understand things like where the one morgue was in relationship to the other. I'm sure we can find moments to fill some of those missing pieces in today, especially the sketches of the two morgues and the layout of the Bethesda campus. But first, before we get started, let's see if I can summarize the more important parts of what Rick presented. This is a good test to see if I even understand the totality of what he set forth. First things first, we all believe that the president's body arrived at the Bethesda morgue in a plain shipping casket and not in the ceremonial bronze casket that he was initially placed in at Parkland. There is overwhelming evidence of that. We have gone over that ad nauseum in prior episodes contained in the autopsy series here at JFK The Enduring Secret, all inclusive with witness testimony, so I believe I'll just start by taking that fact as a given here. I think it's true that nobody really knows exactly where the switch was made. That is, the movement of the president's body from the bronze casket to the shipping casket. Nobody has ever owned up to that, even though we know for sure that it happened. But Rick surmises that the switch was likely made at Parkland Hospital before the president's body even left for transport back to Washington, and that the body was removed from Parkland separately. The larger point here is that Rick thinks it's a much more plausible idea that the switch out of the bronze casket was somehow made at Parkland before the president's body ever left the hospital and that the body was somehow transported as a second casket delivery to Air Force One at Love Field. Rick points out that the ruse of the dead Secret Service agent is perhaps important here, because such a fatality had been reported and was circulating in the media at that moment. The speculation here is that the presence of that rumor right at that very moment regarding a second casualty may have been viewed as a prop to make it easier to remove what appeared to be two victims. But in reality, it was one body and two caskets. But admittedly, this is all speculation on Rick's part as to exactly how the switch was made. Now, let's move to Bethesda. Here are the key points, I think, regarding what Rick laid out. If you've listened to the podcast preview episode on JFK, The Enduring Secret, then you've heard much of this already, directly in Rick's own voice and some storytelling. Hopefully this helps to clarify, though, what you heard in that casual piecemeal conversation. And certainly it may help those who haven't listened to it yet. So let's start. The president's body, now completely separated from the bronze casket, arrives at Bethesda contained in a gray shipping casket that is being transported by a black hearse. This black hearse arrives around 6.35 p.m. at the entrance to the old morgue. The time of arrival is confirmed in the Boisian report. The gray shipping casket containing President Kennedy's body is removed from the black hearse, and has taken up the receiving ramp that is located close to the old morgue entrance. Once inside the hospital, the gray shipping casket is delivered to the old morgue, which is located in the lower level of Building 2. 
It's a short distance away by Gurney. It is not confirmed he was driving this black hearse, but Rick does think that it may have been two individuals from Gawler's funeral home, Tom Robinson and Joe Hagen. There were five men who were there to receive the casket at the old morgue. Four of those men have been identified. These men would place the casket on a gurney and wheel it up to the ramp. And once inside, it was brought down a long, illuminated hallway. Three of the men were known to have been interviewed by reporter Jerry Morlock from a Grand Rapids newspaper. They were Don Rebentish, Paul Nagler, and Robert Muma. The fourth identified man was Malvin Jones. They were taking orders that day from an Army captain, almost unprecedented on a naval site. His name was Michael Gross, by the way, and if you're interested in, in a little bit about him, listen to one of our previous episodes on Mysteries of the Enduring Secret. This process of offloading the casket, bringing it inside, and removing the president's body was done quickly, and as soon as the president's body was removed from the gray shipping casket, the empty shipping casket itself was then taken back outside of the old morgue, loaded back into the rear of that same black hearse, a 58 Chevy, by the way. And then the black hearse from there was driven a short distance back to the new morgue area, and it probably only took a few minutes to do this. The arrival of the black hearse at the new morgue is documented as being around 645, so perhaps a 10-minute period elapsed between the arrival at the old morgue and the disembark and trip over to the new morgue. It is here, at the new morgue, that Dennis David and the crew that was with him that day would perform essentially the same duties as the group that was headed up by Michael Groves. They would remove the shipping casket from the hearse, this time an empty shipping casket. This was done by the Secret Service entourage and orderlies that accompanied the hearse. And that means those in the hearse as well as those riding in an accompanying car that followed it. They would help to remove the gray shipping casket by sliding the casket out of the hearse and then straight on to the jetty. And this is where Dennis David and his crew would pick up the casket and walk it through the double doors leading to the hospital. And just about eight or ten feet to the left was the door leading to the ante room of the new morgue. It is there that they would then place the empty gray shipping casket on the floor in the ante room of the new morgue. It stays there on the floor of the ante room until it is repatriated with President Kennedy's body and then moved into the new morgue right around 8 p.m. Rick believes that the others who helped Dennis David that day, at least six or seven of them, believed to be students from the dental school on campus, all there to offload that gray shipping casket at 645 for the second time, well, none of these folks were ever individually identified. So we do not know if they were aware that they were carrying an empty shipping casket or not. Dennis David himself never picked up that casket, so he never was able to personally gauge whether it was empty or not. He would later ask Dr. Boswell if he and his men had personally handled the president that night. Boswell glibly answered back, you were there. You should know. Now let's pivot back to the old morgue where the president's body is now residing. The president's body is on the examination table now and ready for what we will term as a pre-examination. It is here in this old morgue that two known characters are introduced into the story. White House photographer Robert Knutson and William Pitzer. Knutson was a Navy man just like the president, and he would take the initial autopsy pictures of the president, the pre-examination pictures of the president, before any body alteration occurred, and likely to be just as the Parkland doctors saw the wounds. And Pitzer takes 16-millimeter film of the president's body in the process. We all know the story of William Pitzer from an earlier episode of JFK, The Enduring Secret. This also begins to explain how Knudsen could be called to testify before the HSCA and state that he took autopsy pictures of the president and have that make sense in light of the fact that the official photographer was actually John Stringer, who obviously took the pictures 
after the president was moved to the new morgue. It is here in this old morgue that Gerald Custer and Ed Reed, the two x-ray technicians who were assisting John Eversall that night, would go about their initial duties of taking x-rays of the president's body. And they do it early enough, almost immediately, because the actual body arrived in advance of Jackie Kennedy and the entourage with the bronze casket. They do it early enough that Custer took those x-rays and headed upstairs to develop them. And on the way, in the Bethesda lobby, he sees Jackie Kennedy first coming into the hospital. Rick gives us comfort that we must conclude that these x-rays taken at this session then must indeed be the originals and true x-rays of the president. Regardless of whether these particular x-rays are currently in the records collection or not, or whether they have subsequently been altered or replaced by others. These two men, Custer and Reed, remain in attendance for a period of time after the completion of their own duties and actually stay there in the old morgue and are close enough to the president's body to observe Dr. Humes resect the scalp and begin to apply a small surgical circular saw to the president's skull. Presumably, this was a principal technique applied in the old morgue to alter the evidence of additional bullet wounds. As soon as this procedure began, both Custer and Reed were asked to leave the old morgue. So in essence, these x-ray technicians are dismissed before they are allowed to see anything more that is going on during the pre-examination. But they did see that. There is testimonial evidence that during the old morgue pre-examination, According to Robert Knutson in his HSCA testimony, a probe was inserted from the front of the neck and run completely through the back of the neck to show the direction and the trajectory of a bullet that went through and through the president's body, a bullet that entered from his front. Once this pre-examination was completed in the old morgue, there was a need to transport the president's body under some cover from the old morgue to the new morgue and reunite the body with the now empty gray shipping casket that is currently lying on the floor of the ante room of the new morgue. The pre-examination is completed and the president's body is placed in a gray body bag. Rick presumes that it is then placed on a stretcher, then wrapped in a sheet where an orderly or other person then rolled it down the hallway, covered and without fanfare, delivering it to the new morgue, anteroom area. The pre-examination work and the rolling of the president's body back down to the anteroom of the new morgue would have to have happened before 8 p.m., and perhaps well enough before 8 p.m. to not draw attention. 8 p.m. was the official start of the autopsy of record that was to take place in the new morgue. Well, that gave folks involved at the old morgue about one hour and 25 minutes to offload the body at the old morgue, walk the shipping casket inside, take the body out of the shipping casket, perform pre-examination procedures, alter any wounds if that happened, and then place the body in a body bag, and then deliver it by stretcher using a route taken inside the hospital to the new morgue anteroom. No one knows who made this delivery, but either they or someone else then taking possession of the stretcher would, and without observation, place the body back into the gray shipping casket sitting in the anteroom, thus getting things lined up to start the official version of the autopsy at 8 p.m. Now, let's pivot away from that chain of custody related to the actual body of the president and tell the story of the Gray Navy Ambulance. The ambulance which has the bronze ceremonial casket in it, but which really became the decoy that night. The Gray Navy Ambulance carried the ceremonial bronze casket and Jackie and Bobby and others from Andrews to Bethesda. It was parked right out front as they stepped out and went upstairs to the VIP waiting rooms. Lots of people there to observe the goings-on of that Gray Navy Ambulance. What was observed and reported on by a credible Washington Post reporter was that Admiral Galloway was the first who drove it away from the front, and not the designated Secret Service driver William Greer, 
who had driven there from Andrews Air Force Base. We know that the Great Navy Ambulance arrived at approximately 7 o'clock or so at the front of Bethesda, give or take a few minutes, and it stayed parked there for a short while. And at about 7.15 p.m., it was then observed being driven off by Galloway from the front of the hospital, with the bronze ceremonial casket still inside. The Honor Guard had primary responsibility that night for the physical transport under military protocols, and they were waiting to follow the ambulance around from the front of the hospital where it was initially parked to the back of the hospital where the morgue entrance was in order to actually take the bronze casket out and into the morgue. But they were startled because that Gray Navy ambulance had just taken off without instructions to follow. So all the men of the Honor Guard jumped into a truck and began a sort of impromptu high-speed pursuit to catch up with the Gray Navy Ambulance. By the time they all got into the vehicle and began to follow, the Gray Navy Ambulance had been lost. Was it still somewhere on campus? Where was it? The Honor Guard would hunt for it for the next 30 to 40 minutes or so. Hard to believe, you say, that they could lose an ambulance? Yes, but it was dark and they did. And these antics are all well documented in the interviews obtained by David Lifton, and you'll hear more about them today when we discuss them with our guest. Where did it go, and why did Galloway drive it? Well, Rick believes that the Gray Navy ambulance ended up at a building that was around the corner from the old morgue, not far away, perhaps within 100 yards or so. It was a facility entitled NAMRI, or Naval Medical Research Institute, a facility where they did experiments on large animals and where also biowarfare research was conducted. How did this theory come about? Well, Rick is fairly certain that certain pictures were taken at NAMRI. It turns out that a few pictures, those that were essentially smuggled out as a result of the Secret Service photographer James Fox and the transfer of those pictures to researcher Matt Crouch. Well, later those pictures were identified as having been taken at NAMRI. But how could that be so, since the autopsy did not take place there? Well, there are pictures from this bootleg collection that contain two background objects found in those pictures, two objects that are distinctly different than anything found at the new morgue or the old morgue. The first is a headrest on the examination table. No such headrest was in existence or operative that night in the new morgue. That was verified by Paul O'Connor and James Jenkins, who were at the autopsy, which took place after 8 p.m. at the new morgue. And Dennis David recognized the headrest as being from Namry. The second is the floor tile in those pictures. The floor tile on the floor of the Namry location is distinctive enough that it was noticed as being different by Floyd Reby and Jim Jenkins when they were shown the photos in 1992. And both of these men commented to Harrison Livingstone that they were familiar with the tile in the new morgue, and they noted that there was a different tile on the floor in the Fox photograph. The one photograph that showed the floor, the rather famous stare of death photo. The left profile picture in that Fox photo collection, the photo that includes the headrest, has a clear picture of the left ear, and this left ear matches no other such picture of Kennedy's left ear, implying that the Namry pictures are of a different body. This is a key piece of evidence in the puzzle, and you'll hear more about it today when we talk about this with our guest. As I said, Rick also believes that these pictures I am referring to were likely taken by the Secret Service photographer James Fox, that Fox both took and developed these pictures himself. Fox was taking pictures that night at Namry of a body that is not JFK's. Essentially, all of these pictures then taken by Fox may very well be fakes, in Rick's opinion. That's a pretty outlandish thing. And we'll talk about that as well. The story gets even more extraordinary from there. It is Rick's belief that the Fox photos prove that work was done on another body at Namry. Rick speculates that the Gray Navy ambulance arrives empty at Namry, and it waits to receive this unknown body that was inside. And with James Fox perhaps already 
having taken those photographs. At some point, the body, already photographed by James Fox, the body at Namry, was moved into the bronze casket, and then from there taken by the Gray Navy Ambulance back to the entrance of the old morgue. Just about this time, the honor guard finally comes upon the Gray Navy Ambulance. By now, already parked just outside the old morgue entrance. Admiral Galloway is nowhere to be found. Instead, General Godfrey McHugh was there alongside the ambulance, as if to say, where have you boys been? At this point, the honor guard walks the ceremonial casket up the very same ramp that about 90 minutes earlier, the actual body of President Kennedy, still in a gray shipping casket, was also wheeled on a gurney up that ramp for pre-examination. The ceremonial bronze casket would then be opened inside the old morgue, and sure enough, another body would be presented, a body that surely was not the president's. Well, there is much more to this story from here, but what I have rehashed is a big part of Rick's view on what happened that night, and enough for everyone to understand the basic logistics of things before we dive into the conversation with our guest tonight. And so I'll pause there and let's join Rick and welcome William Matson Law for today's discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to give the credentials of our very esteemed guest tonight. William Matson Law is the author of The Eye of History, Disclosures in the JFK Assassination Medical Evidence. Law has co-authored the books Betrayal, a JFK Honor Guard, Speaks with Hugh Clark, and At the Cold Shoulder of History. The chilling story of a 21-year-old Navy hospital corpsman who stood at the shoulder of JFK during the Bethesda autopsy with James Jenkins. And he's also written Pipe the Bimbo in Red. It's a story about Dean Andrews, Jim Garrison, and the conspiracy to kill JFK with Donald Jeffries as his co-author. William is one of those treasured few who, in the day, spent a considerable amount of time establishing deep relationships with many of these firsthand witnesses, the ones that we're talking about today. And you'll hear some of that as the conversation moves along. So, without further ado, let's get right to our next mystery of the enduring secret, the mystery at Bethesda. Well, we're here today with William Matson Law, for this long-awaited episode. And for those of you that have listened to the podcast preview episode on JFK, The Enduring Secret, you know how good this is going to be. We have two of the top experts in the world on a topic that not many people have this kind of knowledge about. And uh, of course, I'm here with my colleague, Rick Russo, in this series. And today, we are going to extend what was done in that podcast preview and bring William into the picture because William has done so much work historically on the topic and with many, many witnesses that uh, both he and Rick have had firsthand uh, time with. Uh, So with that, welcome, Rick. Glad you're back on with us. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, William, it's good to hear your voice again. Good to hear yours. I guess the way to start would be uh, to tell tell you both a little bit about uh, the journey that I had. From 2016 to 2024, I engaged in a re-examination of the events that took place at Bethesda Naval Hospital on November 22nd, which involved the discovery of two separate loading dock areas, three casket deliveries, two different morgues, an early pre-autopsy examination of the president's wounds, two separate autopsies involving two different bodies, and three sets of autopsy photographs. So uh, perhaps the starting point would be the two separate loading dock areas. And, And I have to say that back in 2016, that was really the catalyst for me to take a, 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 another look at all of this, uh, starting with the uh, account of De- uh, Donald Rebentish. And when he was interviewed back in 1981 and his description 
uh, of the morgue and how they brought the casket and so forth and so on. Uh, how much are you aware, uh, William, of, of uh, Reverend Tesh's story? Uh, I am uh, aware of all of it. I contacted, uh, I tried to find Don Rebentish back in the day, but didn't. Uh, when I was going to do this get together that we had in Chicago in 2015, I did manage to track him down. But by that time, he'd passed away. But I did talk to his wife. And I told her, told her the story about trying to find him. And uh, I said, did he ever tell you about, you know, his being one of the guys that took in uh, a metal shipping casket? She said, oh, many times I've heard that story. So I didn't get to talk to him, but I did get to talk to his wife and she verified it. Well, you know, historically, when I, we, we have two versions of the casket delivery uh, to Bethesda, we have the government's version which basically states that the uh, the casket ended up uh, arriving inside the morgue. And this is according to James Humes to both the Warren Commission, the uh, House Select Committee on Assassinations at 735 uh, p.m. And uh, when uh, two men that you interviewed, and perhaps you can give us a little insight on this, by the FBI agents, Seaburn O'Neill, they both told the HSCA in the 70s that they participated along with Secret Service agents Greer and Kelman and actually physically bringing that bronze casket uh, from Dallas into the morgue at that time, 735. Uh, the one thing I found interesting in the final report the HSCA uh, published stated that, yes, the, the casket arrived, according to Dr. James Humes, at 735 and was brought in by personnel. So they made no mention of the Secret Service agents or the two FBI men. Uh, did did Seaburn and O'Neill ever discuss the casket uh, arrival with you? You know, I did. I did that research well decades ago. Um, I I I did read them the passage. Or I read Cyber, the passage from uh, Death of a President, where it discusses the casket coming in at eight o'clock uh taken in by the differing members of the um, army the navy and uh, marines and so forth all dressed in their respective uniforms and cyber told me you know i've heard about that but he said there was nobody there there was there was nothing there like that it was just it was just frank o'neill and me and uh the two guys that were in the limousine um, and he said maybe some personnel came out of the building and helped us uh, put it carry it in but he said there wasn't anybody like that there now they are, their official time in their report is 717 now there are a lot of people that think that that didn't happen it's in the report I, I don't know I wasn't there but uh, you know of course we can get into uh, you know, Dennis David, who gives the time at is about 635, I think, for, the, for his taking <laughs> the stupid casket. Yeah. Well, that's the other half of the equation, because after you have the Warren Commission and then after that, the HSCA stating a 735 uh, arrival of the casket to the morgue, then uh, David Lifton finds the Lake County informant, which we find out to be Dennis David. Uh, right. And Dennis uh, initially tells uh, David Lifton that the casket came in at uh, uh, 645. But still, this is a, a differential of over 45 minutes from the official governmental uh, account of, of the casket arrival. So we have the government's uh, version and we have the research community's version uh, of events. And it's basically, uh, uh, like we said, Siebert and O'Neill. Uh, versus uh, Dennis David and trying to figure out, okay, uh, where is the body? Because uh, Dennis David said that he received a great shipping casket, not the bronze Dallas casket that right. Stephen Neal talked about. So that's really what we've been confronted with all these years until, as I said, in 2016, coming across the Rebentesh interview that was done with him 
1981 by his local newspaper in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he describes, excuse me, the, uh, the, the casket, which, by the way, they had been informed, he and, his, and the other men uh, had been informed as early as 4.30 that afternoon that they would be receiving the casket with the president's body and that a Navy ambulance would be driving to the front of the hospital with, with a decoy casket, which is the bronze casket, in essence. And so Rabintesh is already aware of all this. And then he says that the casket arrived that they brought in 30 to 40 minutes before Jackie Kennedy arrived in the Gray Navy ambulance in front of the hospital. So right. we have a time differential between, let's say, uh, Rebintesh and his men and what Dennis David stated. And, uh, and, and so that, that, that was the first thing. So for a couple of years, you know, and I think I involved you and Jim Jenkins in this as well. We were trying to figure out, okay, we have a description of a, of a different loading dock, a different area where the casket came in because Rebintesh has his casket put on a gurney, wheeled up a ramp up into the hospital. And then another man and another couple of men in his party wheeled the casket down a long illuminated hallway. Now, when Dennis David described his uh, men receiving the, the shipping casket, he described the fact that they had a wooden jetty that was only 40 inches high and that the casket was slid out of the black hearse that delivered it by the Secret Service men onto the jetty. Dennis David's men picked it up, walked it through the double doors into the hospital, and on the left, about eight feet away, was uh, the door that led into the ante room. And then they uh, left the casket on the floor of the ante room and they left. So uh, that's Dennis David's account. But Dennis right. David's golden dock, his time frame, and so many other things do not coincide at all with Donald Rebintesh's account and what his men did. And, and, and furthermore, over the years, uh, I think it first started with David Lifton, and then went further is the fact that they were using Rebintesh's corroboration for Dennis David's account. And then, of course, as I'm sure you know, uh, in the late 90s, uh, with the AARB, uh, a man named Roger Boysian surfaces, and he was uh, in charge of a group of Marines that were sent to Bethesda that night to provide security and, and also uh, uh, greet the ambulance and provide security for the uh, offloading of the casket. And so Boysian has officially in his report 635. So again, researchers feel that, all right, now we have Boysian and we have Rebintesh all uh, corroborating Dennis David's account. So that's what must have happened. Uh, but I think what we found uh, and we're presented with now is the fact that Rebintesh and his men, in actuality, received President Kennedy's casket and body, I'd say somewhere around 625, 630, brought it into an area of the hospital, which actually held the old morgue, which was really supposedly no longer in use because uh, a new wing of, of, of the hospital opened up that summer, uh, uh, building eight. And in the, build, in the basement of building eight was a brand new morgue, which Paul Connor and Jim Jenkins and others, uh, when they first started Bethesda had been working in. So uh, most people have, had no knowledge or awareness at all of the fact that there was uh, an old morgue space in any event that still existed in the hospital. And uh, so it's my belief that Kennedy, President Kennedy's body was brought to this old morgue, which was located in the lower level of building two. And, uh, and that's where pre-examination took place. That's where photographs of, of the president's body were taken by Robert Knudsen and also film uh, taken by uh, William Pitzer. And, and, then, uh, and then after all of that, that's when uh, James Humes takes a circular saw to the skull of, of the president. And, uh, and that's when the president's brain was removed. Now, the beginning of this whole sawing of the top of the president's head was witnessed by uh, X-ray technician Ed Reed, who told that to the AARB. So 
that's pretty much the time frame in, in that situation. And then what I feel happened, and, and please jump in and tell me if you think I'm off, off base on this, that once the president's body was brought into the old morgue and put on the table, the shipping casket that he was delivered in was put back in the black hearse that delivered it and driven around to the very rear of the hospital where Building 8 was located. And, and this uh, shipping casket was brought in by Dennis David and, and his men. And I believe that casket was empty at that point. Now, the one the one thing I never got a chance to ask Dennis all, uh, when I had an opportunity is who told you to have your men leave the, this casket, which supposedly they, they, they believe was the president's body, carrying the president's body, and leave it on the floor of the ante room? Why not walk a few feet further and bring it into the morgue? Uh, so we'll probably never have an answer to that. But, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense, William, that they would leave the body of the president, not only on the floor of the ante room, but then according to Paul O'Connor, that same ver casket carrying the president's body didn't come into the morgue until 8 p.m. that night. So in yeah. essence, we're talking about a difference of about an hour and a half for that shipping casket to be sitting on the floor of the, of the ante room. <clears throat> so all of these things are, uh, are, are mysteries. Uh, that we're trying to come up with an answer to. But uh, in any event, well, that's... I, I did find a guy uh, that lives here in Oregon, and his name was um, uh, Cox, Jay Cox. And he later turned out to be a, a pediatric uh, physician. But he was there that night uh, in the morgue. Which morgue? I'm not sure now, but... He was in the morgue, and I said, kind of nonchalantly, I said, well, what time did the casket come in? He said, 6.30. There was no hesitation in his voice. It was 6.30. Yep. That popped right up. So now we have more verification that a casket did arrive at which morgue, I don't know, but at 6.30. Um, the, I did know about the two morgues simply because I have a lot of Harrison Livingstone's archives. And in Harrison Livingstone's archives, in his own handwriting, he has some stuff written about uh, two morgues. Uh, so another thing that leads me to posit that you could be correct is that uh, when I was about to publish my first book, In the Eye of History, I had contacted and interviewed Harold Ryder. And the, the morgue, to the best of my ability, had never been seen by researchers or practically anyone really. So we didn't know really what the morgue looked like. And so I asked Harold to draw me uh, a picture to the best of his recollection of what the inside of the morgue was. And when I got it back, I was thrilled to have it, but it, it showed cold boxes in the wall itself, which would normally be in the ante room. And when I showed this drawing to all of the guys that I interviewed that had been in the morgue, the new morgue, they said, well, this, the shelves aren't right. These coal boxes are in the wrong place. They should be in the ante room. So I didn't use uh, the drawing just because there was so much uh, differences between what Harold had, had drawn and what these guys remembered. And so I didn't use the book. Or the I didn't use the drawing. Um, however, years later, uh, Jim Jenkins uh, had contacted uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Richard Lipsy. I had contacted Richard Lipsy. Now I'd met Richard Lipsy in in 2015, and he was to say the least an interesting character. And Jim was there. We had a little gathering in Chicago in 2015, along with uh, researcher Phil Singer. And um, he, Jim, later met with uh, Richard Lipsy for lunch in Baton Rouge, where, where Lipsy lives. And he took uh, Paul O'Connor's drawing of the morgue, plus he took a drawing that he had done, and he took a drawing that, that the drawing that Harold Reidberg had done, and he let Lipsy choose what more he remembered to the best of his recollection. Would you like to know which one he picked? Uh, 
he picked, I, I, he, I, he with, picked, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath. He picked the <clears throat> more drawing that was done by Harold Skip Rydberg, which totally knocked me for a loop. What did that mean to you at that moment? Well, when when at that moment when when I was told that that's the one he picked, it set off alarm bells in my head because I talked to Skip about this and he said, "William, I tried, I tried to draw it through these guys' eyes, meaning uh, meaning Paul O'Connor and and uh, Jim Jenkins and and uh, said I I couldn't do it. This is what I remember." So that tells me that you're probably right, that the body was at some point in the old morgue, and that's probably where the body alteration or the probing, whatever you want to call it, had taken place. Right. Well, one thing I forgot to mention, going back to Rebentesh for a second, in that original interview that was done with him back in 81, one of the things he stated is that... Um, they brought the body in through a service area of the hospital where supplies were delivered. And, and that always stuck with me, you know, because that's certainly not describing the back of the hospital and the wooden jetty that Dennis David and his men were, were, were bringing the casket in, at, at, you know, to what we would call the new morgue. But uh, for, for the life of us, for two years, if I remember correctly, we just couldn't reconcile this. Well, okay, we know there's two loading docks. And they're completely different. And the description of how the caskets were brought into the hospital by, by these two groups of men are completely different. So we know all of that, but we couldn't figure out where was this other uh, receiving area? Where was this other loading dock, if you may? And then, and then all of a sudden, pure, through pure serendipity, I come across uh, an interview done by perhaps the same woman who was working for Harry Livingstone and gave, you know, gave him the notes that you you read in his collection uh a woman by the name of kathy cunningham and she contacted karn i uh i believe is in 1994 or five and and during the course of the interview she asks him a very innocuous question do you remember where the barber shop was uh, at bethesda and that for whatever reason uh created a, a, a thing for him where he says, well, <clears throat> the, the barbershop was right next to the old morgue. Now we had the new morgue that had just opened that summer in building eight, but the old morgue was located in, in the basement and lower level of building two. And it was right down from where they would bring in the supplies uh, in that service area. And as soon as he said supplies and service area, I really thought uh, of what Rebentesh said. And I said, oh, my God, not only we have somebody who's talking about that same area as Rebentesh, but he's talking about an old morgue that existed in that immediate area. So and so now all of a sudden it makes sense why they would Rebentesh and his men would be bringing the president's body in through that service area to a part of the hospital, which uh, basically contained uh, what was considered the old morgue. And then all of a sudden, now we have answers to, to the big question of where do these alterations on the president's body take place? Because we know the wounds uh, at Bethesda, the formal autopsy after eight o'clock, were, were so much different than what was uh, stated by the people in Parkland who witnessed the president's body. Nobody could ever figure out, OK, well, we know the wounds are different. He arrived in different you know, in a body bag as opposed to a wrappings and a bronze casket and all these other things. But nobody could figure out what, where did this happen and when? And I think now we have an answer for that where the early part of the evening right there at Bethesda in the old morgue uh, first. And also we have an answer to the presence of Knutson, who gave a testimony to the HSCA. And then, of course, our Dennis David's story about, you know, seeing these film materials and William Pitzer, his friend's office a few days afterward. And both Knudsen and Pitzer's material show an entrance wound above the right eye in the forehead and a large exit wound in the back of the head. So uh, Joe O'Donnell, who was shown these pictures by Knudsen at one point at the White House, and of course, Dennis David seen Pitzer's, described these wounds uh, to a T. 
but these wounds did not exist by the time the body reached Paul Connor, Jim Jenkins, and the formal autopsy after eight o'clock. So I think now we have an answer to when all of this happened, uh, and um, and hopefully you know give us a clear understanding. Of Rick, a couple of a couple of questions on that uh, with regard to Pitzer, assuming that the film, the sixteen millimeter film, was taken in the old morgue. Was there ever any uh, verification by any of the witnesses that you're referring to that indicated that there, there was camera equipment in the old morgue that, that was capable of doing that? As I recall, in the story, there was a, an articulation that there was camera equipment. It was mounted, so it was, it was, a, it was of a fixed nature, as was described, I think. Um, uh, the only thing pertaining to that, Jeff, that I can recall is when the a when the ARB interviewed James Humes, he said that in the new morgue, they had some kind of closed circuit uh, video uh, camera that could actually send a feed from whatever was being done in that new morgue uh, to various places. Uh, but there was nothing I was never able to get. In fact, I asked Dr. Robert Carney when I spoke with him about whether or not the same kind of video closed circuit TV uh, existed in the old morgue. And he said it did not. But I don't even though uh, I think it's part of the confusion, Jeff, it's the fact that because uh, William Pitzer was head of the audio visual department at Bethesda, the people automatically lean to the fact that, oh, maybe uh, on that day he was working with video equipment that was stationed in the space. But in 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 Dennis David's interview with Paul, uh, Doug Horn for the ARB, Dennis says that, no, the, the footage that he saw in Pitzer's office was taken from the gallery from a distance. Uh, and it was a hand. It was a 16 millimeter camera. So it was it was not video uh, uh, as far as what Pitzer was doing. But uh, so so, uh, so now the one thing that we don't have witnesses for is uh, we know between 635 and also to address Boysian, which has been used to corroborate Dennis David, uh, the Marines working under Boysian, uh, they put the time of 635 uh, and they gave that to Boysian uh, because they, in fact, witnessed the uh, the casket brought into the old morgue at that point in time. In fact, they were guarding it until somebody came and actually brought it into the morgue itself. It was sitting there in the hallway. And again, this was witnessed by Ed Reed and, and told to the AARB. Uh, but we, we, we don't have any witnesses to then get the body from the pre-examination and everything Humes was doing uh, to then the rear of the hospital to the new morgue in building eight in the basement there. Uh, for the start of the eight o'clock uh, uh, official autopsy. We can only speculate that it was somehow brought through the hospital, perhaps on a gurney with a sheet over it so nobody would know, you know, what, what was going on. And then, and then reinterred with the shipping casket that had been sitting there on the floor of the ante room for all that time. Rick, I have a couple of questions on that. And I don't, you know, for both, for both of you, I, uh, I think you mentioned, obviously, Ed Reed saw the initial use of the surgical circular saw by Humes. Wasn't Gerald Custer also present right at that moment? According to Reed, yeah, the two of them were in that in that room at that time. But Custer, I, I'm not maybe maybe William can help with this. I'm not that familiar with Custer's. Uh, interview uh, with the ARB. I haven't read it extensively because my personal dealings with, with Jerry, and, and it's not the personal, was the fact that he tended to add a few arms and legs to, to certain things as his story kept, continued to be told over the years, adding other people's eyewitness accounts into his own as though he had experienced it first person. So that's why I lean toward Ed Reed's account uh, of what happened, even though they were there together. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what your question, I forgot what your 
when you're there. Oh, you asked him whether Custer was there as well. Whether, I don't whether think he or whether he officially made any testimony to that effect, either either under oath or in some research. Uh, I, I think we'd be aware of it. I don't know. Maybe William can help with that. Uh, but I've never heard any of that coming from Custer. Just said Reed. No, I did. I did interview uh, Custer. I believe it was around ninety-eight. Um, might have been 97, but I think it might have been 98. I'm not sure now. It's been so long. Uh, he had he had some very uh, varied opinions. Uh, he he kind of wound up being the hero of his own story. Uh, and I agree with Rick that through the years he had added to his story and kind of made it seem like he saw things that maybe he didn't. Um, he was uh, he was the best way I can describe Custer is he was a curmudgeon. And uh, he was very resentful of the fact that his testimony, uh, what he experienced, had been used uh, primarily at that time by David Lifton, in his words, to make a million dollars. While, in his words, he said, I'm here busting my ass for pennies. Um, at the time, uh, he, he wasn't working in the medical field anymore. <laughs> And he was working as an armed security guard, and uh, he was he was quite bitter toward towards Lifton, and and that sort of thing. Lifton told me later that uh, when after the interview uh, that he had done for, and you've all seen it on uh, the best evidence uh, videotape, that after that interview was done, Jerry Custer sent Lifton a bill for twenty five dollars because Lifton had plugged into his power to uh, power up his cameras and sound equipment and things like that. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure that anything that Jerry Custer said can be believed. And I hate to say that I spent three days with him. Um, but I just don't, he was working on a book with somebody else by the time I'd gotten there. And he, he promised me before I came out because I'm in Oregon and he lived in Pennsylvania. So it was quite a trip for me. And he'd probably, I'll tell everything. I'll, I'll, we'll get it all on film. And then I would ask him questions. And say, well, in the next tape, in the next film, I'll talk about that because I'm under restrictions about what I can talk about because I've got this book coming out. Um, the, the whole thing left a bad taste in my mouth, to tell you the truth. So I'm not sure how, how far we can go in believing Jerry Custer. Simply because well, what if a changes his testimony or her testimony. They start adding things, and that just right. kind of ruins right. credibility. Right. Well, well one thing, one thing that Jerry Custer was a part of, which was a main mainstay of uh, of Lifton's best evidence book, to show the fact that Kennedy's body came into the hospital before Jackie arrived with the bronze casket in front of the hospital. Was Custer said he took the first set of X-rays. And then he went upstairs, and at that point, he saw Jackie Kennedy walking into, into the lobby uh, of the hospital. And this would be right around 7 o'clock or so. Now, if mm -hmm. we believe Paul Connor, he says that the, the shipping casket with the president's body did not come in to the morgue that he was in until 8 o'clock. So how, in fact, could Jerry Custer be taking x-rays before 7 o'clock? And that was always something that people couldn't quite reconcile. But I think now we have the answer to that because perhaps Jerry was, in fact, telling us the truth. He was, but he was taking X-rays at the pre-examination of the president's body, um, you know, before it ever reached uh, the new morgue uh, at eight o'clock. And so that's I how Jerry be, happened to see. I do believe him on that part of his testimony, simply because being in the room with a man while he's telling you this. You tend to pick up on vibes, you know, for lack of a better word. And I do believe that he believed it, that that's what he remembered. So on that part of taking the x-rays and seeing Jacqueline Kennedy and all that, yeah, I, I buy that because he, he was extremely sincere when he said that. And uh, as far as Paul goes, I'm not sure that, you know, Paul had the time right. I, You know, it could have been 635, 645, whatever it was, when they took the body out. I, I think Paul, Paul, in his head, you know, had heard, you know, the body came in at eight o'clock, eight o'clock. So in his head, you know, he's got this time of eight o'clock. But I don't believe it could have been eight o'clock. I think that it was the six 
645, 635, 645 time frame because that's when the chief metal shipping casket came in and that's the casket he took Kennedy's body out of. Well, I know Jim Jenkins believes that timeline. And I and I, and that was the, the backbone of David Lipton's hypothesis that, you know, it was a straight line from Dennis David and his men bringing the casket in, whether it's 635, 645, you know, it doesn't really matter. And then uh, making the assumption that the casket then went directly into the morgue once it's brought in by Dennis David and his guys. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that casket coming into the morgue until we have O'Connor stating, and he's always stated that he never moved off the eight o'clock uh, time frame. Uh, and, uh, you know, people like Livingstone and others wanted to say that he was mistaken. Even Lifton didn't want him to be saying eight o'clock because they couldn't cut, quite put all the pieces together. But if we have this other event in the northern part of the hospital and the old more, this pre-examination, if you may, taking place from 635 to, say, 745, uh, then then that explains a lot of these uh, things that people couldn't reconcile, in my opinion, anyway, you know, um, you know, I want well, to be well we can't we, we can't nail it down because, listen, I have tried in my attempts when I went to I took most of the guys that were left that I had interviewed. I met with them in Florida. And for the very first time, this is at this point, the, the assassination was 39 years. So at this point, for the very first time. These guys were in the room with one of the FBI agents who were there, Jim Seibert. I got him to go on camera for the very first time uh, with these guys. And nobody, you know, nobody could, could give me a timeline. I tried desperately to have a timeline. And when I realized that that wasn't going to happen, I just abandoned the timeline and just tell me what you know. So there was no timeline. It could be established. So we just don't have it. Right. Right. Well, so again, they could be, could be correct. Right. Well, they couldn't figure out the difference between Dennis David's casket arrival and and the eight o'clock, uh, you know, O'Connor account of the casket coming through. Nobody could really figure that out. And of course, you've got a, an hour difference between Dennis David and then you and, and then Siebert and O'Neill. Uh, that their casket comes in at 735. So, yeah, we've got all these varied accounts and there isn't an easy way to to kind of put it all together. And then, of course, you've got that moment that happened when you were in Westmont for the very first. You know, this is a gathering of the honor guard for the very first time after all those yep. years put, put together by Phil Singer and yourself. And then you invited Dennis David and others to join uh, that gathering. And Dennis David tells his story about the early arrival of the great shipping casket. And that absolutely floors you, Clark. And I, I'm not sure what the reaction was on the part of the other Honor Guard members uh, of the fact that as far as they're concerned, they officially brought the bronze casket into the hospital at eight o'clock. So what in God's name is this man talking about 635, 645 in a great shipping casket? So well, see, can they, you talk a little bit about how that they, whole thing went? They've about? never heard that before. These guys had been apart all these years before Phil Singer and I brought them together. It was mostly Phil that brought in the honor guard. He's the one that contacted them and got them to come in. And I got the guys that I'd had before and, and talked them into coming in. But the honor guard had never heard of this before. And it caused quite a stir uh, when they heard this story, which goes back to the ambulance chase goes back to you know them uh, loading the the casket and having it driven to uh, Bethesda and they'd been the honor guard had been there some 10 minutes before the uh, before the uh, motorcade came in because they went via banana helicopter and got out and they were standing there for about 10 minutes and then the motorcade shows up and um, they get told to you know wait for this ambulance and they do and then there was a truck there and the ambulance takes off because this crush of people come out the ambulance takes off at that point so commander bird who is in charge of the honor guard says get in the truck 
So they're in the dark. They're in a place they haven't been before. They all get in the truck and they take off after the ambulance. Okay. And so they're following lights and then the lights disappear and they can't find the ambulance. So then I don't know if either one of you have ever been there, but I have. I've been to Bethesda and it's a huge complex. So they're going around this huge complex in the dark and they go around at least twice and maybe three times. And on the third time they come back and the, and the, and the ambulance is there. The great Navy ambulance is backing into the docking area. And, and Hubie said to me, we, we did a book together. So I have all this on record from him. He's gone now, but we have all this on record. And he says, um, you know, at some point going around and around in this circle, we should have bumped into that ambulance because there wasn't anywhere for the ambulance to go. But we we lost them. When Phil first contacted, uh, when Phil Singer first contacted you, Clark, he was talking to him about this. And he says, well, there was a short period of time where, uh, you know, we lost track of the ambulance. And, and, he's, and Phil comes out and says, well, didn't you lose it? No, no, we didn't lose it. We just lost track of it for a little bit. He goes, you sure you didn't lose it? Or words to that effect. And Yubi laughs and Phil laughs. And he says, oh, okay. I guess you could say we lost the ambulance. <laughs> so at some point, they lose this ambulance. And can't find it, can't find it. They're going around in the circle. And finally, they come back. And here's the Great Navy ambulance pulling into the dock. So where was that ambulance for however long they were gone? Now, when I asked this in the in the uh, in the gathering we had at, at Westmont, we asked Tim Cheek, who was one of the honor guards people, point blank, you know, did you did you lose the ambulance? And he says, well, either we weren't where we were supposed to be or the ambulance wasn't where it was supposed to be. So th that's how he answered that. So. Uh, I think we can safely say that the ambulance chase did happen. The ambulance chase, for whatever reason, uh, we have it on record, it did happen. The ambulance disappeared for a period of time. What was that used for? That period of time. where and Why? Why did the lights go out? Where did the ambulance go? Well, what that's happened? The, yeah, I mean, that's the that's the question. You know, I've worked in hospitals most of my adult life. And, uh, you know, the question is, I'm sure there's, you know, very large uh, 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 multi-story parking garages and things like that right on the campus. But normally there isn't garaged areas where you could pull in and then be hidden for any period of time. So where could, even if they went over to, let's say, and I think, uh, you know, the discussion is going to eventually get here to the question of whether it went to Namry, but if it went there and they dropped off uh, something or they went somewhere first and then waited and then came back, <clears throat> where did they go that they were so covered or that the <clears throat> was so unpredictable that no one would go look there to begin with if they were making rounds around the hospital? So, I mean, I've never been to the campus, but I've been on a million large urban hospital campuses, probably very similar to what you know they have at Bethesda. And uh, one would ask yourself where that might could be. And, uh, you know, I, my first reaction was, you know, did they run up into, into a parking garage somewhere and just sit on the second floor or third floor or something like that? And then, and then when the time came, came right back down and pulled, the, pulled it right up. Was there, was, was there any uh, particular buildings or edifices like that that might have been or taken? Jim uh, told me that there were there were emergency rooms. There were a number of emergency rooms in different spots. So it could have happened in one of those places. Yeah, then um, maybe they just pulled right into the ER and then they became sort of uh, the confluence as, as, of all the other ambulances that were there. As as Donald Rumsfeld might say, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> and I'm afraid at this point, that's just one of those things we don't know yet. Well, maybe we'll never know. Well, let's see if we know this. Uh, if we believe Donald Reventesh and what he was told, by, by, by the way, by a young army captain 
giving him orders in a naval setting. And that was one of the things that Reverend Tesh, uh, you know, could never get over all those years is the fact that he was told he was going to be taking orders from a young army captain. But nevertheless, he's told that that they're receiving the president's body and that the uh, ambulance with the uh, with the bronze casket or this whatever casket from Dallas uh, would be empty, that it was a decoy. So uh, if if we take that as, as fact, and if in fact that's true, then uh, then the honor guard for 45 minutes or so are chasing an ambulance, which originally was empty. But then when they find catch up with it a little before eight o'clock, and this is from both your your accounts with, with you, Clark, and your book, and also from James Felder, and, and is also described in Manchester's book, Death of a President, that they all of a sudden, after this long chase, they, they come across this ambulance that's parked there. And there's no one, the casket's in the back. There's no one in the car except for standing by the, the ambulance is God, General Godfrey McHugh. Now, originally, when you, you Clark told me that, or maybe he it was in your book that you did with him, I thought, well, maybe he's added that into his story because that's what you and Phil Singer read to the men in Westmont, the whole death of a president account. Uh, of Godfrey McHugh being with the casket and so forth and so on. But then when I had the opportunity to talk to James Felder, he said the exact same thing, that no, McHugh yep. was, was the only person there uh, when we brought the casket in. So the real question that comes to mind is, all right, if that's true, and the president's body's in this bronze casket there are, that the, the honor guard's about to bring into the hospital, where's the Secret Service? Yeah. Now, that's the first thing. That's the first thing. But but as it turns out, the honor guard brings his casket up the same ramp in the same service area as Reverend Tesh's men received the shipping casket earlier in the evening. And, and we know this because of the detailed account and description that you, Clark, gave you that's in your book, Betrayal of how mm -hmm. they had a struggle walking up the ramp, dealing with the railing, and at the top of the ramp on the right was a door that they had to literally tilt the casket in order for them to get into the hospital. And then it was yeah. put on a gurney and wheeled in the direction of what they were told was the what was the autopsy room. And then at that point, we, we know from Sam Bird and from James Felder that uh, they were the only two that, that brought the uh, the casket into the, uh, into the morgue. Everybody else was left outside in the hallway to guard and provide security. There was a body that came out of that casket. But there's now we got the contradiction of, OK, what bodies in this bronze casket being delivered to the old morgue in that part of the hospital at eight o'clock when you've got a shipping casket coming into the new morgue at eight o'clock, accounted for by Paul Connor and witnessed by a number of people of the president's body taken out of the shipping casket and put on the table. And, and whether or not we want to face the reality of, of this crazy situation, it seems that we have uh, two bodies. Now, the honor guard, as you said, in that meeting in Westmont, always oh, thought that they brought the president's body into the hospital at eight o'clock and they put in their That's official it. report. They had no idea what was happening at the other end where the new morgue was and, and, and what Dennis David was dealing with earlier in, in the evening and, and the fact that the president's body was, in fact, on the table in the new morgue uh, at that point in time. And, and in fact, I'm willing to bet that even though whoever's still alive in that honor guard has no idea that there were two morgues and, 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 and the president's body was in one place and they were dealing with another body altogether. And, uh, and I'm not just speculating or, uh, or putting forth some kind of crazy theory. The reason why I believe this was the second body was, the, was because we have three witnesses that actually described the wounds on, on the head of this body that's in the old morgue that the honor guard brought in the bronze casket. And the wounds are a tremendous damage to the right top of the head into the face. And that's described by uh, Captain David Osborne. It's described by Richard Lipsy. And it was also told to me by James Felder, who was sitting in the room next to Sam Bird, who was also sitting next to Lipsy in, in, in that situation. So, uh, you know, the wounds are different. On the, on the two bodies. 
uh, from the descriptions that we got. We, you know, we know there was a large, uh, massive wound in the back of President Kennedy's head, and you know that's that's described by O'Connor, Jenkins, etc. Uh, you know, in, in that official autopsy, but no one ever described there being damage to the right front top of the head or into the face of the president, and it's not reflected in any of the photographs. That, that supposedly were taken as well. So, you know, we have two major contradictions in that area. Well, well I'll, add, I'll add to the confusion with, uh, if, you, if you've if you read Betrayal, then you know, Yubi said he was opening the door at one point so that I think it was McHugh could go into the morgue. So he could see inside of the morgue for five to 10 seconds. And he said he saw President Kennedy laying on the table. He said he couldn't see any wounds to the body, but he did know that the, the lower extremities were covered with a sheet. But there was a, uh, a chalk block, what he described as a chalk block underneath President Kennedy's neck, which raised his chest up a little bit. Um, and as you know, if you've seen photographs of uh those autopsy pictures that have been out in the public domain for a number of decades. Uh, what we see in the morgue is a, uh, a table that's got a stirrup connected to it. And that's what President Kennedy's head is resting in, a stirrup, a metal stirrup, not under his neck where the chalk block was, but a metal stirrup. That's kind of a, an interesting thing. Well, uh, I, I do want to address that because that's a whole other story unto itself. But but I want to go back to uh, you, Clark, for just a second. When he made that statement of looking through the door uh, and seeing the president's body on the table, I couldn't figure out how that hap how that could happen, because in the hallway of the new morgue in Building Eight, uh, the, the door there's one door that opens up into the ante room. So you can't see that from that entrance, you can't see the morgue at all. And the other door at the other end of the hallway, according to Jim Jenkins, was was locked. Now, I don't know if it was locked that night, but even then, looking through that door, whether or not you could even see the table or the head of the table or whatever. So I can never figure out how Yubi was able to see the body and, and know about the chalk block and everything else. But if you're in the hallway and looking through the doors of the old morgue, as we could see through the Rydberg drawing, there's no problem with line of sight. Once you open those doors, the table is right there, slightly to your right, right in front of you. So uh, again, for me, corroboration of the fact that you, Clark, and the honor guard were at the old morgue after eight o'clock and, uh, and had nothing to do with the president's body whatsoever. Uh, now, getting to what you mentioned, the biggest problem people have had for many, many years in trying to reconcile what they're seeing in those autopsy pictures is the fact of this metal headrest that's in the Fox photographs that all the men that you've interviewed have said didn't exist in the morgue that they worked in. So, in fact, they couldn't find anybody uh, who could state Custer, that that table Custer existed. in an interview you did with me, Custer told me that there was a was a, a metal stirrup that connected to the table that you could remove. But getting back to Custer, I'm not sure you can believe that. Well, he might have, he might have heard that from another source and added that into Absolutely. his own story to try to reckon Absolutely. because as you and I both know uh, that was you know Jerry uh, a lot of times you know. But yeah, uh, I agree. But but now you know we do have an answer for that metal headrest and that table. And, and it happened in 1992 when I, as you know, I gathered a, a number of these men from Bethesda together in Pittsburgh and did an interview with them. More, it wasn't so much an interview, it's just a catharsis to allow them to just, uh, you know, rec remember what it is that they experienced and, and, and share all of that. And at, at one point, they're looking at the Fox photographs that were kindly provided to me by Mark Crouch, who had got them directly from James Fox. And um, and, and, and while Connor and Jenkins are talking about the fact that that metal headrest did not exist on a table that they were in the, in the morgue they worked in, all of a sudden, Dennis David looks at the photographs and off camera says, that looks like the table at Namry. 
Now, as it turns out, there was a, a, a facility called Naval Medical Research Institute. As Dennis said, it was about 100 yards behind the very back of Bethesda Naval Hospital up on the hill there. And they dealt with bio warfare and, and experiments. And, and they worked with chimpanzees and animals. Right. Which makes more sense for the kind of headrest that was on that table. And also maybe provide us with an answer to in that one photograph, the stare of death photo from Fox. You see this wooden contraption in the far right corner. Nobody could figure out what was what that was. They thought it might be an X portable x-ray machine or whatever. But knowing that room was used to uh, autopsy animals could very well have been a, a cage to hold a chimpanzee or a monkey or or so forth and so on. But in any event, Dennis David states that that table is what he remembered seeing in Namry. Now, all these years, you and I, uh, I'm sure many other researchers have said, well, if we could only find photographs of an autopsy taken that took, was taken place in Bethesda Naval Hospital's morgue, we'd be able to compare them to these Fox photographs and determine once and for all if the Fox photographs are fake or fabricated or whatever, or if they really were taken in the Bethesda morgue. Well, photographs of the Bethesda morgue itself have never surfaced in any context uh, with any uh, other autopsies done. But uh, in, in, in reverse, what we do have is a photograph of that room, uh, an autopsy taken in that room, showing the table with the metal headrest and the same floor tiles that exist in the stair of death photograph in the Fox collection. And that photograph that, that I've seen uh, firsthand was of the uh, autopsy of William Pitzer. The table has a metal, although interestingly enough, William, the metal headrest has been swung around to the rear of the table and Pitzer's head is actually on a chalk block, which is what everybody who's doing an autopsy uses, chalk blocks. Right. That, that's just a function of, of, of the whole thing. And, and the floor tiles uh, in, in the Pitzer photograph match exactly to the floor tiles in that one Fox photograph, the stair of death. So in my opinion, the Pitzer uh, autopsy was done off book uh, at Namry in the same way that this body uh, was photographed by Fox at, at Namry the, the night of the assassination. And I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to speculate that the body in the Fox photograph, in fact, all these autopsy photographs that were told of Kennedy was this other body altogether. We don't even have one photograph of President Kennedy in the public domain in any context, in my opinion. You know, and uh, and I'm sure you or I mentioned to you, you 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 saw that Zoom presentation that was done in Dallas back in November mm -hmm. that I had the one photograph of the ear comparison. We have the left profile Fox photograph of the body on the table with the phone on the wall in the background. And you can clearly see the definition of the ear. And back in those days, they didn't have DNA. So next to fingerprints, the, the other way you can identify somebody who's through their ear. And so I took a photograph of Kennedy speaking in Fort Worth that very day, inverted it and put it side by side with the body on the table. And the two ears don't even mat. It's not even in the ballpark. Not well, even close it, to me. It's one of the things that, that when I uh, interviewed uh, Jim Jenkins and Paul and others in 2002, uh, Jim said the same thing, that, that the ear looks strange. Uh, Dr. David Mantic, who has seen... Uh, the, the so-called original x-rays or what he considers to be copies. When he was asked about this question, because the ear does look strange, he said, well, sometimes, uh, you know, the body, you know, relaxes in the, the muscles in the face. So this could be just the body relaxing. And that's why the ear is not uh, looks the way it does. Now, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But for me to believe that there there's another body, I'd have to I'd have to have more proof. I'm not saying that that's not possible. I'm just, because you know you get into the story of the Air Force uh, Colonel that supposedly came in that night an hour or so before the events happened, and they were told this is a this is a a Colonel that has already been prepared for burial. We're going to bury him at uh, at uh, Arlington on Monday. We need a place to keep him. So don't log him in, don't touch it, don't look inside. And so 
they left it there. And in the morning after the autopsy was completed uh, and they had to begin to clean the morgue, uh, the Air Force colonel or major had disappeared. There was no casket. So uh, that was a story for whatever reason. Does that have to do with an extra body? I don't know. Jim told me, Jim Jenkins told me once that if I had it all to do over again, I wish I would have looked inside that casket. Right, it could have right. cleared a lot of things up. Right, because we we have no we have no definitive proof that there was even a body in the casket, or no, or no. if there was or if there was whose body it was in. But the reason why I point to Namri and these photographs and another body is the fact that this very man who had these photographs in his possession not only developed them but I believe actually took them because he was, in fact, the Secret Service photographer, James Fox, is that before any of this happens, Fox is sent by Robert Bauck, his superior, to meet a plane that has the body of a dead Secret Service agent. And that's the story yeah. that Fox also told to Mark Crouch a, few, you know, a short time before he passed away. And he said that this was not the president. This was one of our own. Uh, now, <clears throat> my belief is that they picked up this body that was brought to Namry. Fox photographed it. And this body was used to take the place of Kennedy or at least fulfill that agenda uh, to, to make people believe that they were actually seeing photographs uh, of the president's body. Uh, and the fact that Fox was involved with this uh, retrieval of a dead Secret Service agent's body, the fact that he has these photographs in his possession, um, you know, and could also explain why what could have been an empty casket leaving the front of Bethesda Naval Hospital and disappearing for 45 minutes and then coming back and having a body in it, as I shared with Jeff, with Jeff, you know, this is pure speculation, but I'm trying to just apply a little common sense here. Perhaps that, that ambulance with the bronze casket drove all the way to the back of the hospital, went to Namry, which these men in the pickup truck would never have found. And, and, that, and at some point, the, the body, after being photographed by Fox, uh, is put in this bronze casket and then brought back to that part of the hospital uh, where the honor guard brought it in. Uh, again, pure speculation, but... Rick, Rick, Rick I want to intervene here. I want to, because I think I heard two different things, and I want the audience to be clear on this. When the bronze casket was eventually surfaced around 8 p.m. at the old morgue. Uh, who, was there anyone who observed, I think you just said yes, uh, a body being removed from the bronze casket at the old morgue? Well, you, you not only have James Felder, who, brought, who along with Sam Bird, who's not alive, so we, we don't have his story, uh, but Felder, for sure, witnessed the body taken out of the casket. And interestingly enough, he said that it was wrapped like a mummy, completely sheets completely around the body and the head. But we know that that body in that room w was then autopsied and witnessed by uh, Richard Lipsy, number one. And number two, Felder saw what was done to the body. And number three, Captain uh, David Osborne states that he was the one that actually saw, sawed the top of the skull uh, of the body and removed the brain himself, which is which has no sense of reality compared to what Humes and Boswell and Fink and O'Connor and Jenkins were dealing with with the president's body at that time. So, so I'm a I'm a bit of a simpleton, as you guys know, and I'm certainly uh, fascinated by the back and forth. Uh, but when you hear that and you're fairly certain that the start time in the new morgue was about eight o'clock and that it was very clear that a body came out of the gray shipping casket. And again, I realize the basic premise here is we don't have an exact timeline, no matter what anybody says. So maybe that's the answer to this. But if there was almost simultaneously a body at the old morgue coming out of the bronze shipping casket at just about the same time, eight o'clock that a body was coming out of a, a gray shipping casket at the new morgue. I mean, wouldn't that by definition suggest that there were two bodies? I mean, it almost, it almost begs the question that it couldn't be anything else but two bodies. I mean, again, I'm being a simpleton about that, but what am I missing? Well, you're not. And the thing is, the reality of that 
is something that a lot of people just, you know, aren't able to confront. You know, the fact that, my God, how could they have another body behind, beside the president's being autopsied that night? But but it also but it also begs another very simple question. Richard Lipsy had seen the president close up. In fact, he tells a story in later life that he went to the White House, sat, I believe, in his rocking chair, actually uh, was relatively close in nature, got to observe the president, I think on more than one occasion would probably have a pretty good idea. And certainly anybody would have a good idea of what he looked like. He was one of the most photographed individuals in the world. So he's now in the autopsy and he's relatively close. And, and obviously uh, someone going through an autopsy, as we hear so many times, may or may not look uh, or be as recognizable given you know, the severe head wounds that he had undergone. But don't you think he would have recognized the pre uh, someone who was not the president or or what would be the uh, circumstance under which he he wouldn't question that maybe the person he was looking at was not the president if he was right there? Well, uh, you know, one can only uh, speculate as to whether the body was somewhat of a lookalike to the president. But according to the damage described by Osborne, by by Felder, by Lipsy uh, of the front top of the head into the face. And they say that into the face, you know, uh, could have disfigured the body to the and plus just the impact at that moment in time. But dead president and seeing the body looking that way would have just you know, why would they in their mind? Why would he even have questioned the fact? I mean, even the honor guard never questioned the fact James Felter to this day has never questioned the fact that that was somebody other than JFK. I mean, I never presented this to, to Felder, but he's, he's of the belief that, yeah, he was dealing with the body of the president that night. So it's hard to say unless we were really there to see what they were witnessing, you know? Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, everyone that was involved in this, uh, no matter how cool and collected they were, was under some level of trauma. I mean, this was a traumatic event. And I think that you have to take that into consideration under any circumstances. So uh, I, I could, I could clearly understand that. I mean, you know, uh, the body had already been dead for seven or eight hours too, as well as, you know, might've been some level of uh, rigor mortis or other elements that began to. Uh, well, Richard Lipsy claims that the president's arm was raised quite a bit. One of his arms was raised quite a bit and he had to get up on, the table and help lower his arm. Now, nobody in the, if you want to call it the new morgue, nobody in the new morgue in that autopsy saw Lipsy do that. That they, they had trained medical technicians and I can't understand why he would have to get up and get on the table and help put President Kennedy's arm down. Now, he also describes the, the morgue as uh, nobody was there except three or four people and I was one of them. And he says that the the seating was not bleachers, but they were chairs. So that would lead me to believe he was in the old morgue at that point. But, you know, this the, the thing about two bodies, I won't go there unless we have somebody coming out saying, yeah, I was part of that. And yes, there was two bodies. Um, I'm open to it, but I need cold, hard fact, not just speculation. Well, you know, it's a matter of reconciling, you know, up until this point when people would hear Lipsy's story, nobody can even make sense of it because everything he's describing was not witnessed by any of the mainstream people you've interviewed, like O'Connor, Jenkins, et cetera. You know, and so, you know, people are saying, what is this guy uh, uh, nuts? And plus the fact that he's saying that they asked him to help pull the, the arm down that was already somewhat in rigor mortis because they were in the process of washing blood off the president's chest. But, now, I, I you, you've interviewed these these men, O'Connor Jenkins. Have you ever talked to anybody that stated that they washed the body, uh, you know, before the autopsy started or, or that there was a need to do that? Uh, I, against, think Lipsy, I think Lipsy said that. Yeah, Lipsy said that. Yeah, uh, but I've none of that that the president's body, you know. So uh, one other thing that you said earlier, because you, you you were we were trying to to come to terms with the timeline and we're wondering whether Paul Connor was correct at eight o'clock 
with the shipping casket come in. I just remembered that ARB interviewed um, John Van Housen, who was part of the Gallers group that were there to, to work on the body and embalm it after the fact. And Van Housen, in his interview with the ARB, said, we, I arrived around 7.30. He actually arrived with Joe Gawler and, right. and was there uh, sitting in the bleachers. And then he says, around 8 o'clock, the casket came in, and he was one of the witnesses who actually could say that he saw the, the, uh, the body bag removed from the casket and put on the table. In fact, Van Housen volunteered that information during the interview. He wasn't even asked what you saw, you know? So that stuck out in his mind. So again, I think that's one more corroboration uh, of the eight o'clock, uh, you know, situation. And the fact that Paul Connor was just so adamant about it, all, no matter when he was interviewed, even that mock trial for Oswald in England, when, when uh, Bugliosi was asking what time the body arrived and he said eight o'clock, he never varied off of that time, uh, all those years. So I kind of want to, I kind of want to lean toward Paul's account. Ray, I ask another question, and this goes back to Lipsy. I recall, and you, you all can correct me, but I thought he stayed very late into the wee hours and uh, was involved in the process after the autopsy occurred with Gawlers. And what didn't all of that uh, presumably occur in the new morgue? So if he had been in the old morgue, wouldn't he have questioned why all those procedures were being done in then in the new morgue? I mean, you know, I, I, I think the obvious, you know, question would have been, why did we start this process in the old morgue? And now I'm in the new morgue. If that was in fact the case, well, he was there I, I think, I think yeah, Jeff, I think you have two distinctly separate events. Both events have doctors working on a body. Both events have people that are, I think Gallers is definitely with the president's body in the new morgue. I have no idea who reassembled the body that Lipsy witnessed being autopsied, who I believe Captain David Osborne was the one that was working on that particular body. But uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's two completely separate situations. Well, As Williams said, everything about Lipsy's account to the HSCA, to Andy Purdy's, especially who did the interview with him, has no connection whatsoever to all the actual witnesses like O'Connor and Jenkins and even, even others that were in the uh, new morgue with the president's body. He, you know, the, fa the fact that uh, Lipsy says there was hardly anybody in the room when I was there sitting in the, in the gallery. I mean, we know that the, uh, the, uh, the autopsy room with, with the president it was, it was filled to capacity. We, we um, Richard Lipsy was an extremely strange guy. Um, I remember that we had a little get together, you know, before filming started and, uh, we had, we had pizza and we, I don't know what he was expecting, but he did show up at the last minute and he, I remember we were leaving and Phil Singer's the one that brought Lipsy into this and, and he stopped Phil and he chewed Phil from one end to the other and said, how dare you bring me into this room with these people that, you know, he says, you know, I don't, I believe that Oswald did it. And you've got all these other people here saying something different. And he just chewed Phil off one side and down the other. <laughs> and then the next morning, uh, when we were getting ready for the event and having breakfast, um, I was trepidatious to talk to him because of the way he'd acted. And I said, how did you sleep? last night, uh, Mr. Lipsy, and he said, slept like a rock. <laughs> Put his hand on my arm and said, slept like a rock, like I was his best buddy. So, I mean, it was just one of those deals. His moods could go up and down really fast. Um, wh what else do I want to say about Richard Lipsy? Did, did, um, did you feel that he attended your event uh, for the sole purpose of trying to see what these other men who he was with that night at the honor guard had to say about what they remembered. I think that was a part of it. And I think a part of it was his ego. I I think that part of him wanted to see what was going on. You know, part of him wanted to be part of it to see if, if, you know, if they had anything that was different from him. Um, I've told the story before. I, I've told it to you that um, I had told Dennis, you know, because I knew Lipsy's account was going to be a little bit different than Dennis. I said, Denny, I don't want you to, you know, 
get into a confrontation with him or anything. Just be cool about this whole thing. Dennis and I had become very close friends by then. And I'm in the restroom. I come out because I hear voices. And I'm hearing Lipsy's voice, and it's very raised. And I'm hearing Dennis, and his voice is raised. And and I come out, and here these two are. And Dennis is just, he's shaking, and he's angry, and his eyes are bugging out of his head. He's got a cigarette in his mouth that's dangling from his lips. And and they're they're yelling at each other. And and I hear Lipsy go, well, well, you know, it could have been, you know, there could have been other people there. And obviously he had told Dennis about, you know, I was one of only three or four people. And and Dennis was trying to tell him the story. And I said, now, Dennis, calm down now. And he says, he's calling me a goddamn liar. You know, <laughs> and I just had to I had to take Dennis physically. I've I'd never seen Dennis angry before. This is the first time in all the years I'd known him that I'd seen him lose his cool like that. I had to physically take him and move him down quite a few feet to the bar where I could say, now, Danny, I told you not to get this guy upset because we want to get him on the record. And he's here, and we didn't even really know if he was going to show up. And here he is. So just let's be calm. Let's get it on the record before we have all this you know, big problem. But that was quite a deal. You know, of course, Lipsy tells the tale that that he he was one of the only three or four people in the room that he helped straighten out President Kennedy's arm. He literally had to crawl on the table and that whole thing. And um, it was the whole thing was bizarre. You know, and he also said that there were chairs in the room. You know, and of course, <laughs> let's go back to we gave him. Jim gave him more drawings, and the one that he picked was the one Harold Rydberg had done, where it didn't match the other's recollections at all. <clears throat> so, I don't know what to tell you about that, but he... Just to, just to let you, William, just to, just to let you know, uh, because that is a very important detail, along with the fact that the, the cold boxes were inside the old morgue, where yeah. in the new morgue, they were in the ante room. But the other important thing was that gallery. It was a podium which actually had seats on top of it. And, and not only it, was it described in, in Lipsy's HSCA interview uh, as a seat, you know, he was sitting in chairs, but then Felder also corroborated that story. Felder described it to me is he said it's a podium with like theater seats. Now, what, what both Felder and Lipsy are describing has no connection whatsoever to the bleacher seats that were in the new morgue uh, that was described by everybody uh, that That's the gallery correct. was standing in. Right. So we That's have correct. those two things to, to establish two separate rooms altogether. <clears throat> but, we, you know, you had said earlier, we don't quite have evidence of, of two bodies that that we can pinpoint this thing definitively to. But there's one more mystery here that we haven't addressed yet. And you're aware of the, the story uh, of you, Clark, talking about the fact that at the end of the night, they brought a, a, a wooden African casket. Uh, they put the body in the casket. It was wheeled all the way down to the rear of the ambulance. And at that point, when they went to pick it up and put it in the back uh, of the Navy ambulance, it, it weighed so much more than the Dallas casket that they realized immediately they need to add two more men to the six men that were already part of this honor guard. So, yeah. and then I think depending on who you talk to, this casket ranged anywhere from 600 pounds to 1,200 pounds. And I think you, Clark, said it was at least 1,000 uh, yeah. in, in, in interviews that he had given, okay? But we, yeah. know, that, we know that we've got a 1,000 pound casket being removed from Bethesda Hospital into a Green Navy ambulance by the honor guard. And this is an official act that's in a in an after action report that's in true. Gawler, in Gawler's after action report. They state that uh, Roy Kellerman insisted on his Secret Service men removing the president's casket from the morgue and putting it into the Navy ambulance. No mention of an honor guard whatsoever. But the real distinguishing part of all this is the fact that the casket that was ordered from Gawler's, and it's in the official paperwork of Gawler's, states that that casket weighed 255 pounds. It's another one of those discrepancies. Right. But to me, it seems to point out the fact that we've got two groups of men 
uh, removing two different caskets, one weighing a thousand pounds, another one weighing 255 in, into two different ambulances. As, in, as crazy as this sounds, this is what the facts seem to tell us. We don't want to confront the reality of what that means, but nevertheless, you know, it's hard to avoid when given these it's, testimonies by different it, people. It's not the, it's not that I don't want to confront it. I'm willing to confront it. I just want more than air. I mean, we have, you're absolutely right. It points in that direction. And I'm not going to say you're wrong. I'm just saying I want some more foundation. I I'm I need more than, well, here's what I think. Based on all these discrepancies, this is what I think. You very well could be right. I'm not the person to say yay or nay one way or the other. Like you, I wasn't there. I only gathered together the information and here's what we have. But if there was two bodies... I want somebody to come forward and tell me there was two bodies somewhere out there. Somebody knew or somebody knows. Well, we may, never, we may never get that. All we can all we can really depend on, William, is the accounts of two different groups of men. You know, the accounts of Captain David Osborne and his description in a letter to researcher Joanne Braun about the nature of the wound and the fact that he sawed the skull cap and removed the brain. Which, uh, which all, you know, in fact, Humes and his official autopsy with the president's body said there was no need for a craniotomy. The, 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 the hole in the back of the head was so, it just, the brain fell out into his hands. So we yep. got those two contradictions there, you know, and plus the fact that you got Felder and you've got uh, Lipsy uh, describing the wound on the bo uh, body they're witnessing completely different than the wounds on President Kennedy's body that the official autopsy is described by O'Connor, Jenkins, et al. So, you know, we have these two camps, if you may, that are completely different in, in, in what they're witnessing. Uh, and, and so does this give us a little bit of leeway to think that we have to be talking about two bodies? Maybe. Rick, Rick, uh, <laughs> before you, before you browbeat William too much, let me, uh, uh, let, let me ask uh, a simple question about this. If, in fact, you believe that uh, Ed Reed witnessed, you know, he's telling the truth about witnessing Humes in the old morgue, performing a procedure on the president's body. I mean, if you believe that, then it's it's not a great leap of faith to believe that he was he, he was potentially altering something. Uh, although there seems to be a series of things going on there. I think they were actually trying to perhaps figure out what exactly did happen without a large audience. And uh, that may have been more standard protocol than you believe. Uh, but let's assume for a second, you believe that in fact, he was, you know, uh, using a saw to, to alter something. Uh, do, it, it, is that potentially supported by all of the what appears to be pretty clear information about the size of the wound being much larger by the time they got to the official autopsy versus what was seen at Bethesda? I mean, at the Parkland. I mean, well, there, two, two, two things with that, Jeff. Number one, uh, Reed only witnessed up to the point where he saw the saw in Humes' hand, the scalp had been reflected back, and it looked like Humes was about ready to use the saw on the president's skull. But then they were sent out of the room. So the, the important thing out of this whole exercise that Humes is about to do is to remove the brain. That was never witnessed by Reed because they were already out of the room at that point. But, but again, if we accept Paul Connor's account of the fact that when they received the body, uh, in the new morgue uh, at eight o'clock and his job uh, in, in autopsies is to perform the craniotomy and he goes to start doing his job and he looks in uh, to the cavity. There is no brain that, that in fact, I think that's an extension of what Hume's because the brain in fact is the evidence. It shows us the bullet tracks, what direction, if there's still any fragments of metal or anything, all of that is, is evidence being removed, not so much altering the wounds to give you a different perspective of what the wounds are. You know what I mean? At least I think that's the way it went. All right. And it was deliberate.
Absolutely. And moreover, you've got the the uh, <clears throat> uh, pre, uh, I, I don't know how Doug Horn described it. When Humes itself works out, um, you know, it looks like there's apparent surgery to the head. He's actually doing a preemptive strike on his own actions. In essence, he's bringing forth the, the, the fact that something's been done to the skull of this body. And, and it turns out he was the one that actually did it. I mean, you know, the the alternative the alternative to that was that he was simply using a surgical circular saw to perform uh, something that would routinely have been done in an autopsy at that moment or a pre autopsy work. I, you know, that's that's. I mean, the problem here is that there's a lot of speculation about what exactly that saw was used for, and so on and so forth. So, um, it, it may very well have been used to alter a wound, uh, but it may not have been. It's, you know, there was no experts there to determine exactly what was happening. But it, on the other hand, if you take Knudsen's testimony, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think I'm, I'm trying to quote you a little bit, or maybe not quote you, but uh, pick back up on what you said earlier in, in other conversations. The probe that was photographed and discussed uh, in Knudsen's testimony clearly indicated that there was a trajectory of a bullet from front to back that went completely through the president's neck. And the probe showed that. And if that was really and truly the case, and Humes was really and truly there, then all of that would contradict everything that's documented in the sort of official autopsy that happened in the new morgue after eight o'clock. Well, you're you're exactly right. Moreover, in the pre-examination, as witnessed and photographed by Knudsen and and and, and uh, Purdy really put his feet to the fire uh, during the HSCA interview to get him to actually even discuss this because he was put on, on asked by the Secret Service, you know, to, to never discuss it is the fact that the, the very throat wound that's described so definitively by Knudsen going through the front of the neck, out the back of the neck does not even come, this wound doesn't even come into play at the official autopsy. In fact, Berkeley tells the doctors, tells Humes, don't touch that. Don't, don't, don't dissect it. Leave it alone. So that's why the neck wound <clears throat> was never dealt with during the official autopsy. And in fact, they stated they thought it was just a tracheotomy. And it wasn't until a day later that they changed that story. You know? Well, it, is it plausible to believe that the progression of events, as I listen to this, I certainly we don't know, we're all speculating, but it, it seems to me that in this kind of a circumstance, it might be reasonable to believe that they would bring the president in, they would spend some time with him almost privately with a very small number of people doing exactly what you were talking about before they had a larger audience to make some determination of what they might have had. Uh, it, it, again, that part of it doesn't seem terribly nefarious. Uh, Obviously, if they if they combine it with uh, something that uh, it is evidence altering at that moment, then all of a sudden it does become something more. Uh, it, but you know, again, I could see the logical progression of events being that they sat in the second uh, the formal autopsy, and they were then directed in some way not to do something that would recreate what they'd already known. Uh, because they didn't want the wider audience to know it. And, and certainly all of that without without fail means that there was later testimony that perhaps was incorrect and and perhaps fraudulent. But uh, it, but but I guess what I'm trying to suggest to you is that there may have been multiple reasons for for what they did. And and uh, it's it's I don't think it's clear when you when I listen to this now and I've probably heard the story about four or five times from you, Rick, that there's, uh, you know, that there's a clear indication that they altered the wound, the, you know, the wounds at, you know, in the, uh, in the old morgue, that maybe they did. It, it's, it sounds like perhaps or likely they did, but they clearly had information regarding shots that came from the front that were suppressed when they got to the second and more formal autopsy in the new morgue. Well, no, you're exactly right. Moreover, maybe William can expand on this. <clears throat> but Paul Connor certainly stated over the years the fact that at the end of the night, 
Humes and Boswell had absolutely no clue as to the direction of where the shots came from. Not, not, not am I correct in that, William? You are correct in that, and that's what that's what the FBI agents told me as well. He said they came up with with uh, with the single bullet theory and stuff like that after the body was gone. I believe it was O'Neill who said, and if they did that after the body was gone, what else did they change their mind on? Seibert said it like this. When you're doing an autopsy without the body, you're out of the realm. You're into you're you're out of the realm of fact and into the realm of fiction or words to that effect. Thank you so much. I think we covered a lot of the bases. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah. I so if you, really want to come back, if you want, I'll do it as much as you want. You just have to let me know when you want me. And I hope we could wrap that up to your satisfaction to have. And then I don't think I don't think there's anything that we didn't discuss. I think yeah, we pretty no, much it's wonderful. About. Yeah, it really is. Sorry that uh, we had technical problems. We had to do it again as That's well. Okay. You, you've been amazing, William. Really. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Really appreciate it. And, and I and honestly, I'm in awe of listening to both of you. I may have tried to be or ask critical questions, but I'll just say this. Uh, it, it is unbelievable the depth of experience and the recall that both of you have as if it were yesterday. And uh, I think when you live with it for 35 years bet, or going on or past 35 years, it, it tends to get that way. It becomes your life. And it certainly became my life. I had no idea when I went into a bookstore at the uh, hmm. In the mid 80s or the 89 or 80, 88, I think, 87, something like that. And I picked up a book. I had no idea that it was going to take me down the pathway that I've been on all these decades later. Well, you're uh, you're an important uh, element in all of this. And this is this has been a treat. So thank you very much. And I hope I hope we'll be back with you soon. Uh, I, I It's just a, it's an absolute treat every time. You just you just let me know when you want me and I'll be there. Okay, we'll we'll do. All right. Thanks, Thanks William. You too, you too Jeff. Yep. Good evening. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to this episode of Mysteries of the Enduring Secret, and please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, JFK: The Enduring Secret. And remember, you can find our award-winning podcast, JFK: The Enduring Secret, on all of the popular podcast outlets.